Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Illinois Learn to Hunt presents Squirrel, Rabbit, and Dove Hunting, also known as Small Game. As we'll continue through the presentation, we'll just kind of call them all Small Game from here on out. Um, just some housekeeping things. If you're new to our webinars, uh, you do not need your video or your microphone tonight. Uh, you guys can sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation that we give you guys here. Uh, and if you do have any questions, you can put that in the chat. Uh, the chat is the same window that the, we said that we're going to start at 703 so you can respond in that and we will answer any questions that you may have uh, if we can answer them while we're talking we can but if not someone can answer them in the chat and if we don't get to them then we will have time at the very end for a question and answering session so if you have any questions at the very end please let us know and we will sit here as long as it takes to get them answered for you oh, excuse me um, today's course, we're going to talk a little bit about how hunters are conservationists to start it off. Then we're going to go into the regulations for uh, hunting the small game. And then we're going to talk about land access, different strategies for each species of small game to go hunting for. And then, like I said, at the end, we'll have a question and answering session. Uh, our presenters tonight are going to be Dan Stevens. Dan, if you want to say hi. Sure. Hello, everybody. Uh, a huge thank you for everyone coming out tonight. Um, yeah, so hopefully we'll, we'll get you uh, at least started and hopefully get you some information so you feel comfortable enough to, to either, you know, try small game hunting yourself or potentially find a mentor who's willing to, to take you. Um, so thanks for coming. Awesome. Um, Adam, you want to say hi real fast? How's it going, everyone? My name's Adam, and I'm glad you guys are joining us today. Great. And then I'm Jason Buckley. Uh, just a couple other things before we get started. Uh, we will be sending out a survey uh, tomorrow. So if you guys have any constructive criticism uh, or anything like that, please fill that out and get that back to us. Uh, we do take those and implement any type of uh, good points that you guys may have on our PowerPoints to try to make them as helpful as possible. So if we didn't go into something in enough detail or uh, anything like that, please let us know. Uh, all right, with that, we're gonna get started. Dan, take it away. Sure. Thanks, Jason. Um, just a couple more housekeeping uh, things I want to comment on really quickly. Um, we are recording this session and you will receive a recording um, link to a YouTube video for this. Um, when we send out that survey tomorrow, that, that link will be embedded there. So if you do, uh, for some reason, have to take off early, um, just know that you will be getting the full recording in your inbox tomorrow. So you can go and kind of refer back to it or, or finish it up if you, if you have to take off. Um, but with that, like Jason said, we always like to start off with, you know, a quick discussion about how basically why hunting is still relevant, even in this um, kind of modern society. Um, uh, Jason, I noticed we had a chat um, asking about audio. If you could connect with him and try to get that situated, that'd be great. Okay, so like Jason mentioned, we always like to start off with a quick discussion about why hunting is important. So why is it still relevant to kind of a, a more modern society than we've historically had. And the, the first thing we're really gonna discuss is kind of the economic benefits of hunting. Um, so obviously license sales contribute um, a lot of revenue um, to state agencies and other organizations so that they can manage um, the habitat and manage these populations. But there's another form of, of funding that is uh, primarily through hunting and through uh, the shooting sports. So this is federal legislation that was passed by the United States Congress in 1937. Um, it's colloquially referred to as the Pittman-Robertson Act um, after the two, the two congressmen who uh, basically sponsored the bill. Um, but uh, more, I guess, in, in the, the name of it, it's the uh, Wildlife in Restoration Act. So essentially this act places an excise tax on the sale of hunting and shooting equipment. Um, it's typically about a 10 to 11 percent tax. It, it kind of depends on whether it's archery equipment or handgun, how some of that, that percentage is, is, is differentiated. Uh, but essentially, what, what's really cool here is it's not an additional tax that, that's kind of rung up at the time you go to purchase um, a firearm or ammunition or archery equipment. It's already pre-built into that price at the manufacturer's level. Um, that revenue is then all sent to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Agency and then they allocate that money back to the um, states. And there's a, a short formula that they utilize to essentially figure out how much each state receives. Um, and it's essentially based on the land size of the state as well as the number of hunting licenses that are sold. 
Um, so you can see it's really important to, to not only, you know, purchase firearms and equipment to, to put revenue into this fund, but it's also important to have a lot of license sales in a particular state so that the state can receive kind of its maximum um, amount of money. Uh, you can kind of view it like uh, sort of like the, the census. Um, but that money is then obviously transitioned to the state and they essentially use that to conserve wildlife. Um, so they can provide more hunting and target shooting opportunities. Um, it can be used for wildlife research. It can be used to purchase new land. And the really cool thing about the way that this funding was structured is that it's very specific to how it can be used. Um, so essentially the state cannot just say, hey, we're just gonna take this big lump of money um, that we got from this PR Act and just throw it into the, the general revenue fund for the state. Um, they can't do that. There's very specific, basically descriptions and justifications about how this funding can be used. Um, and that's something that's very important, again, to conserve um, wildlife habitats and is increase these hunting and target shooting opportunities. And so moving on, you can see, if we think back to, to how that Pittman-Robertson Act formula applies, um, I mentioned a major component of that is the number of license, hunting licenses sold in a particular state in a particular year. Um, and so I just wanted to quickly show basically a trend graph. So the highlights um, of hunting license sales in Illinois over time. And we've had kind of this systemic decline since the mid 1970s. And I think a graph like this is particularly interesting because you can a lot of times correlate it to kind of what's happening in the real world at that time. And so if you look, you know, the, the mid 1930s and into the, the mid 1940s, we had this enormous uptick in license sales. And if you think back to what was kind of occurring at that time, it was towards the end of World War II. And so we essentially had all these veterans come back from overseas, come back from serving, and they continued to buy hunting licenses and they started hunting. And so we saw this huge uptick in license sales. And then essentially we saw those individuals age out of the population. And as a hunting and conservation community, we've done a fairly poor job of replacing um, those lost license sales. And so that's one really important component of the Illinois Learn to Hunt program is that we're trying to essentially recruit new hunters as well as retain those existing hunters. Um, and that's kind of what this course is about, is trying to recruit new hunters um, to hopefully feel comfortable to take that next step and to actually try hunting for themselves. Now, I always like to, to discuss you know, how landscape level changes alter wildlife movement. And for a lot of the species that we're gonna to discuss today, specifically rabbit, um, dove, really their populations have, have drastically changed over time. And, you know, if you look at some of these maps, so on the left here, we have basically the early 1800s. Um, so we can see that the vegetation and the, the land cover was primarily prairie mixed with forest. Um, now, you, if you look at this present day land cover, um, you can see that we're pretty much a lot of agriculture and a lot of urban development. Um, so it's almost a biological desert in a lot of these areas for some of these species. Um, and so that's kind of just what we want to highlight. You know, if you look at a map like this and you try to figure out where wildlife would live on a landscape like this, it can be a little bit difficult. And so that's how we hope to, to use this presentation is to start at a broad scale level and then kind of narrow it down to a more fine, a more, fine scale and a more nuanced approach um, that we hope can give you enough guidance to actually uh, be successful in the field. Hunters, um, in addition to some of the economic benefits of hunting, they can also uh, be an active voice for natural resources conservation. Um, they can, you know, support legislation that maintains hunting opportunities and land access. Um, so essentially, hunters can support you know wild places and wild things. Um, hunters can also support the concept of non-privatization of wildlife. Um, so essentially no citizen owns the wildlife. Um, the wildlife is collectively held in the public trust. Uh, if you look at some of the other uh, countries, mainly over in Europe, um, they have a different concept of this privatization of wildlife. So in a lot of European countries, the landowner actually owns the wildlife where in the United States, um, the wildlife is again held in that public trust. Um, and just kind of to, to summarize again, hunting is extremely important uh, to conservation efforts. Hunting can also be important biologically. 
Um, hunting can be used to reduce overabundant populations. Um, it can minimize disease risk and human wildlife conflicts by reducing the overabundant populations, but also by reducing population density. Um, kind of as, as we've seen with the, you know, the coronavirus, obviously density is, is a big driving force of disease transmission. And so spreading that density out, just like social distancing, um, has, a, has a wide range of benefits um, in terms of minimizing disease risk. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam and he's gonna begin discussing regulations. Um, and just a quick, I know the regulations can be a little bit dry at times, uh, but it's all very important and very pertinent. And once we get past the regulations, we're really gonna dive into some of the hunting techniques and some of the strategies that you can utilize um, as you try to hunt these, these various species. Um, so with that, take it away, Adam. Thank you, Dan. So what regs do I need to know? We're gonna go over legal game, licenses and permits, lottery applications, hunting seasons, and post-harvest procedures. So uh, starting with le one legal game we're gonna be talking about is the Eastern Cottontail Rabbit. We've got a nice picture right there for you. Up next we have for squirrels, we have the gray squirrel on your left and the fox squirrel on your right. Pretty standard, you guys can see those at, at you know ever, any park really that you go to. Not legal game for squirrels is the red squirrel, which sometimes people call the fox squirrel the red squirrel, so that's incorrect. Uh, the red squirrel is an endangered squirrel and it's super, super small uh, and a lot of times a lot brighter red in color. And then the flying squirrel is, as well as not legal game. Legal game for dove are the most common are morning doves. And then once in a while here in central Illinois, you'll see some Eurasian collar doves as well, um, which are non-native. So the first thing you're gonna need to hunt in Illinois is your hunter education safety course. Anyone born on or after January 1st, 1980 needs to take the course. Um, there's several course types, instructor-led, online self-study with a field day component, or now if you're 18 years or older, you can take the whole class online, which is nice. Um, if you wanna get it done in a weekend, uh, you're probably able to, it is just a little bit time consuming. You gotta read about, give or take, I think 10 chapters somewhere in there, uh, take chapter quizzes and then a test at the end. Um, so it is not very difficult, just does require some time. Uh, another piece of identification is your Illinois Fire, Firearm Owner's Identification Card or FOID card. Uh, regardless of who owns the firearm, Illinois residents who have a Illinois or Illinois residents who have a firearm or ammunition in their possession must have a valid FOID card. FOID cards are issued by the state police and not the IDNR, and they do have a 10-year expiration. Um, if you guys want to buy a firearm before this hunting season, I recommend to do this right now as soon as possible. Uh, since the shutdown, uh, the state police is backed up um, with FOID applications. Uh, it's not difficult to fill out. You basically just need to do it online, fill out all your information, upload a picture, uh, but the processing does take a while. It might take two, a couple months at this point. Uh, usually it's anywhere from four to six six weeks, but with the delay, I would get Are we there? Uh, yes, I can hear you now. Sorry about that. Oh, you're fine. All right, you get on the slide, Adam? Uh, it shows the FOID card slide at the moment. Okay, there you go. Thank you, there we go. Okay, so moving on to hunting licenses and permits. So the three main things you guys are gonna need to hunt small game uh, in Illinois is your regular base hunting license, which is uh, usually 1550. Um, then your state habitat stamp, which is $5. And then if you're hunting any migratory species, you're going to need the HIP certification, uh, which is the 
harvest information program basically just tracks all species that migrate so ducks geese and doves it is free but if you guys are doing it in the store you're buying your licenses at a store like walmart or any sporting goods store just make sure that the um person at the register does put it on there some people don't know if you need it or not so just make sure to always ask i just put mine on there anyways since it's free um I like to do all kinds of hunting and I never really know what I'm going to do when. So I kind of just put it on there just to be safe. And then the following year, when you buy a license, um, it will ask you what kind of uh, migratory species you hunted. And if you didn't hunt any, you could just say zero. So easy enough, but please do remember that because if a conservation police officer stops you and you're hunting doves and you don't have that, uh, it's going to be a big no, no. So finding an IDNR uh, site-specific regulations. So here on the right, this is uh, what a hunter fact sheet looks like. Um, basically, it gives you all the rules and regulations for each IDNR site, uh, whether what kind of check-in, check-out procedures it has, if you need a windshield card, what kind of non-toxic shot, uh, non shot you can use. Um, it tells you what, how many acres there are, all the species you can hunt. So basically every uh, IDNR site is a little bit different and all those rules are gonna be listed on the sheet. So these are very important to read before you go hunting and to know what you can and cannot do at each specific site. So moving on to uh, dates and limits. So for rabbits, uh, your bag limit is four, your possession limit is 10. Um, your hours are sunrise to sunset, and that starts November 2nd and runs through February 15th of the following year. So rabbit hunt lottery, this is an upland game um, permit lottery. The harvest of rabbits is allowed on all of these sites. It is a free permit. One permit holder and three hunters are allowed. So um, if you do draw a free permit, you are able to bring up to three other friends with you, friends or family, whoever it is. They do need a hunting license and all that stuff as well, but only one of the people need a permit. So they can just come with you for the day uh, and it is free. Uh, so please do register for this. Uh, it's a great opportunity to get out and hunt and a lot of the sites that are offered are maintained very well and have a lot of game on them. So it's a super fun time to get out with your friends and family. So I do recommend that. Uh, for rabbit hunting, you do need blaze pink or blaze orange. You need 400 square inches of solid, not camo, um, blaze pink or orange at all times. So if you guys look at the picture on the right, uh, the thumbs up, thumbs down, you cannot have the one with the camo pattern on it. It has to be solid colors. So jacket and a, or a vest and a hat um, will suffice. Moving on to squirrel seasons and dates. Uh, your bag limit for squirrels is five daily and your possession limit is 10. Um, your hours for that are half an hour before sunrise to a half an hour after sunset. And for squirrels that starts August 1st and runs all the way through February 15th of the following year, it is closed on the 22nd to the 24th of November and the 5th through the 8th of December for the counties that you can firearm deer hunt in. Dove seasons, um, so your bag limit for that is 15, possession limit is 45. Uh, your hours are sunrise to sunset and there's no limit on Eurasian collar doves and turtle uh, or ring turtle doves but um, for your morning doves you do need to follow the 15 and 45 and basically what the bag limit and possession limit mean um, is you can harvest up to 45 doves. Um, again, only 15 a day, but up to 45. Once you reach 45 in your freezer, you have to use some up or gift some um, away for you to be able to hunt again legally. Um, so 
you can harvest 15 a day until you reach your possession limit of 45. Then you do need to use up some of that game again before you can go hunt more. That's what that means. And your possession limit does double um, or triple depending on how many people you have with registered hunting licenses in your household. So again, the harvest information program, the HIP that's needed for dove hunting, uh, it's important for all migratory species. It is free, but remember again, uh, if you're getting your licenses at a store, remember to make sure that the clerk puts it on there for you because not all of them do know. So just keep that in mind. And then another lottery for doves. Um, it is going on right now. It ends next week on the 30th for the first season uh, or the first lottery, I'm sorry. Um, and basically this is another free lottery uh, for another free permit. Uh, for a dove site, I believe you get to hunt the first five days of September on this permit. Um, and there's a bunch of DNR sites that have dove sites that they, um, you know, plant sunflowers or something, some sort of uh, seeds for the birds. And you get to sit at a stake and basically hunt doves for free. So um, it's a good opportunity again for, for anyone who wants to try it out. I do recommend putting in for the lottery. Uh, these are some of the sites, or I'm sorry, these are all of the sites that dove hunting is allowed in that, for that lottery. Um, so I'll read off some of the counties really quickly. White, Side, Montgomery, Will, Lee, Madison, Cass, Henry, Kankakee, Will, uh, LaSalle, Christian, Knox, Kendall. Um, so there's kind of sites all over the state. And um, even if it's not in your county, it's not that far of a drive because they're pretty spread out. So um, yeah, make sure to check that out. So post harvest, uh, remember to check in and check out if you're hunting at an IDNR site that requires you to do so. Uh, remember your bag limits, so 15 doves daily, and then your possession again is 45, five squirrels daily, possession limit is 10, four rabbits daily, possession limit is 10 as well. Now we'll move into legal methods of take. So to hunt small game in Illinois, shotguns and archery equipment are the only legal methods of take that may be used. You are able to use 22 for squirrels on private land. Uh, there are a few sites that let you use 22s on public land for squirrels, but not, not many. Most of them are shotguns only. Um, so here on the right uh, is a picture of kind of your main styles of shotgun. So your over under, your side by side pump action and auto loader. Um, the over under and side by side are, are pretty popular for upland bird hunting. Um, I mean, you're able to use them for any kind of hunting that, you know, involves a shotgun, but those are kind of, uh, you know, usually people use those for upland. The kind of downside with those is that you do only get two shots um, and then you do have to, you know, break open the barrel, reload. Um, and they can be, they tend to be a little bit on the pricier side. Um, my favorite kind of shotgun to use is pump action. You can use that basically for anything from waterfowl to upland to small game. Um, and you can really uh, find them for really good price most of the time. There's a bunch of used ones out there. Um, even new ones are not that expensive. I think a new Remington 870 is about $350-ish. Um, and you do get to hold three shells. So you do get one extra, you know, more than the side-by-side -side over under. Um, but you can't hold more than three shells in any shotgun if you're hunting. Um, if there has to be a plug in the magazine, otherwise it is illegal. Um, so you do only get to have three shells no matter what kind of shotgun you use. Um, and then you're finally your auto loader, which is super popular nowadays too. Um, it's great for beginner shooters because the action of putting the next shell into the shotgun, um, once you shoot, the gun uses the gas to load the next shell and it's good for new hunters because the um, recoil isn't as much. So you can get to uh, get used to shooting a shotgun with one of those pretty easy, uh, especially if, you know, someone's a little bit afraid or not used to shooting. 
um, that is a very good option for them. Rifles for squirrels, uh, no rifles during rifle or firearm deer season, excuse me, 22 and 17 calibers only. So only rim fire uh, cartridges. And this is basically, again, mostly on private ground, although there are a few state sites that allow 22 and 17, but um, there's, I think there might be only like two or three of them in the whole state. So uh, that's mainly for private ground. So some shotgun rela related regulations. Uh, you may use any shotgun gauge to hunt small game in Illinois. Your shotgun must be able to hold only three shells. If your shotgun has the capacity to hold more than three shells, you must put a plug into the magazine tube to ensure that it can only hold three shells. Again, like I explained earlier, uh, only three, otherwise you are illegal. And then here on the right, you have all the different gauges that they um, sell shotguns in. 410 being your smallest, uh, 10 gauge being your largest. So um, usually anything 12 and 20 are kind of the most popular gauges that everyone uses these days. Patterning shotgun. Uh, it is best to pattern your shotgun before the season to find the effective range. Use the same shells and shot size you plan on using during your hunt. Um, so basically what patterning a shotgun is, is you're just finding the effective range and, of what choke and what shot you have, what shells you use. Um, so usually you want to pattern your shotgun at about 30 yards, which is a good gauge to see what, what it does. And you want your patterns to look like the top picture here on your right. You want a nice even um, spread of BBs. You don't want it to be like the bottom one where there's, you know, a bunch of gaps and, you know, a few BBs in between. Um, and that just basically shows what your shot is doing once you're shooting at an animal, uh, whether it's flying around the ground like a rabbit. Um, you know, you can kind of just see how your shot is spreading and what it does when it's flying. Um, so, you know, it just basically makes you a better shooter and more aware of um, how to effectively harvest your game. And then a neat chart here on the bottom, um, just showing you shot size and shot numbers. It's a little bit counterintuitive. The higher the number, the smaller the shot. So it's a little bit backwards. So when you're buying shells at the store, make sure to kind of remember that. Um, boxes nowadays kind of tell you what, what shells are for what really, but um, just so you guys know for future reference, um, the bigger the number, the smaller the BB. So moving on to choke tube basics and selections. Uh, choke tubes can be screwed into the muzzle to change shot spread. Um, improved cylinder, modified cylinder, and full are all widely used for small game hunting. Super full chokes may make it difficult uh, for a shot at close range. Um, usually kind of the three choke tubes that come with a gun when you purchase one are improved, modified, and full. And you, you can, you know, swap those out super easy depending on what you're hunting and kind of where. Um, here on this chart, it shows you what chokes are kind of meant for what kind of yardage. Um, so your improved cylinder is good to about 30, modified to about 35, full to about 40. Um, and, you know, it all depends on really where you're hunting and what you're hunting for is when you change those out. So, you know, if you're hunting pheasants or something and you know they spook really easy in that field, you might want to put in a full. Uh, or, you know, if you can get close, you might want to use an improved cylinder. So it just kind of comes with, uh, with experience. You guys can figure out what works best for you. Shot placement. Uh, so swing through your target for moving game. This tactic applies for all game birds and including rabbits as well. Um, you want to use the swing through method. So kind of the phrase for that is butt, belly, beak, and bang. You kind of want to start at the back end, swing through towards the head, and uh, pull the trigger then for a nice, effective, clean kill. Uh, kind of like you look at the picture here on the bottom. You want, you want it to look like the one on the left. Um, the one on the right, you know, is potentially wounding the animal and, you know, putting BBs in, in meat that you're going to want to eat. So you want to make sure to get um, 
effective with a shotgun so you can put down game effectively and, and, and get a clean, clean, quick kill. Non-toxic shot requirements. So uh, most IDNR sites are going to be switching to uh, non-toxic shot. So kind of our rule of thumb that we like to use around the office is you just buy non-toxic shot. That way you never have to fumble around and make sure to know which one's which. You just always have proper. It's better for wildlife anyways. Um, so just kind of pay attention to that. It's not needed in, in every site at the moment, but they are switching it to, um, to non-toxic shot for most sites here shortly. So just be aware of that. And now we're gonna turn it over to Jason for land access. Thanks, Adam. Okay, so in Illinois, uh, there's a couple different types of land that you can go and hunt on. There's the hunting preserve, which is gonna be your outfitter or your private club that you can go and pay to go hunt there. Um, there's also gonna be public land where that's broken into federal public land, state, county, and then this IRAP program, which I'll talk about in a couple slides. And then there's also private land, which uh, the majority of the state is private land. Uh, if you are interested in going to hunt public land, uh, when you go to the IDNR website, they will give you this map that's on the right-hand side of this slide, and you can select the region that you're interested in hunting in, and then that will take you to a alphabetized list of your sites. And that's good if you know the name of the site that you're interested in hunting in, but it's not very helpful if you're exploring new sites to go and hunt. So another tool that we have found that is useful is this website. So if you guys want to take a note of this or uh, jot it down somewhere, uh, this is Engineered Pursuit. Uh, so some citizens took the information and they made a Google map layer and they put pins uh, where the public sites are at. And then if you go to this and you pick, on, you pick the pin and uh, it will take you to the IDNR website and then that will give you the hunter fact sheet, which Adam went over during the regulations portion. So, this will help you find the regulations for each of these different sites and see if there's hunting there and uh, what the different rules are uh, for those particular sites. So this is just a, a easier way of looking at where the sites are at. If you're interested in exploring a certain area of the state and trying to see what's around there, uh, it's a little bit easier to find those sites compared to an alphabetized list, we think. So hopefully that's helpful for you guys. Another helpful tool is uh, this public land hunting report. This is uh, provided on the IDNR website as well. And this gives you basically the idea of like how much hunting pressure is at each site and how many of the different species have been taken off that site from the previous year. So you can see which site has a lot of the dove fields on it. Um, you see 102 dove fields were taken at that one site there at Banner Marsh. So you assume that that's a, they have probably some flowers there set up for you to go hunt there. Um, so that's another resource that you can use. I know uh, some people, I, I, me included, uh, have to drive an hour to go hunt uh, on a public site. And uh, this can help narrow down which sites are, are worth checking out and trying to explore where to go at. So another great resource that the DNR tries to give you guys. And then there's also private land uh, in Illinois. So over 96% of Illinois is uh, private land. And uh, so it is kind of hard to find public land to hunt on. And so the DNR uh, owns 1% of the state and the Shawnee makes up its almost a whole 1% by itself down in the southern part of the state. Uh, and it's difficult to find access to this. The best way to do that is still uh, trying to find out who owns that piece of land and uh, knocking on doors and trying to be polite and ask permission to go hunt in places. Uh, it is intimidating for sure, but that's a old fashioned way for sure too. So, um, the way to find out who owns that land would be utilizing plat maps, and that's using tax data to see who owns that land. Uh, you can buy plat maps. Uh, you can also go find this information at like the courthouse and uh, see who uh, owns the different land. Uh, they have now apps, which you also need to pay for, uh, that have this information on it. Um, the most famous one currently is uh, on X uh, Hunt, and that allows you to download uh, map layers and see who owns what land, and it takes all that data puts it all on your phone. But uh, again, you have to pay a uh, subscription fee for that. Uh, another thing that uh, kind of is another barrier for people to go hunt on land is liability concerns. 
So there is an act, uh, it's the Recreation Access Act for land and water. And uh, you can, so that takes away the responsibility of the landowner if they do give you permission to hunt on their land. So the DNR does have a little contract that you can print out off their website. And that is like Hunter X agrees to go hunt on landowner Y's property and will not sue landowner Y if they get hurt. But uh, that's all part of that act. So you don't need that contract. That act covers you. But uh, if as soon as you exchange money, uh, for access to their land, that act no longer covers you, and now that person is liable uh, for your safety on their land um, within reasonable uh, legal issues, stuff like that. But um, so if you do find someone who says, no, I don't want the liability, you can tell them if you allow me to hunt there for free, you don't have any liability to worry about. Uh, another thing, if you're walking around on public property and you're not used to walking around the woods and not used to seeing posted signs, uh, keep an eye out for those. Uh, ignorance does not count. Uh, if you just stumble on someone's land, it's still trespassing. And uh, we just like to bring this up in case you're not used to it, but uh, if you see purple paint on a tree, like the photograph on the right, that is just as good as having a no trespassing sign. So there is a law that allows people to paint their trees purple. And if you see a line of those, then that's your boundary and you should not cross that. Then uh, the IRAP program, which I talked about, is another way of accessing some public land in the state. Uh, they are constantly trying to find new ways of expanding this. So keep an eye out for their updates. And I believe, like even this slide in the, in the past couple of years has, has gone out, well, this slide's not years old, but um, instead of 16,000 acres, I think it's up to 19,000 acres. I saw that this year. So um, yeah, so they, it's a program for landowners to work with the DNR to get a management plan for their land and uh, do a conservation work or something like that to, uh, to make their land better than what it is. And then the DNR gives them management assistance and possibly even funds to help them with that project. And then in exchange for that, they allow people to come and use their land. Uh, they could choose cert a whole list of different things that uh, different types of species to hunt there and uh, things like that to allow people to come on their land and use it. Uh, so you can go on this website and try to find land near you that is worth going for. Uh, it is a lottery to get into uh, this land, but uh, if you're a youth or if you're a first time hunter, uh, first time adult, and that is classified as someone who has not hunted that species in the past five years, uh, then you have a higher chance of winning that lottery compared to someone else. So it's just another uh, resource and um, in a state that is definitely public land poor, uh, that's just another another way to try to find that access to some land to go hunting on. Okay, I believe Adam is gonna talk to us about rabbit equipment and rabbit strategies. Thanks, Jason. Um, so yeah, rabbit hunting doesn't involve a lot of equipment, so it's um, pretty user-friendly, I should say. Um, you don't really need much. Uh, good boots that you can walk long distances in. That's what I would invest uh, most of my money in. Something that'll keep your feet dry and keep you out in the field longer. Um, so, so make sure to get some good boots. Um, everything else, you know, you don't have to pay too much attention to. Uh, boots are kind of my important, most important thing. Um, heavy duty brush pants. You guys can get those at Walmart probably for about 25, 30 bucks. Um, a shotgun. And then a game vest, um, preferably orange, so you can meet some of that um, 400 square inch requirement. So rabbit habitat, uh, thick cover, edge habitat, cedar thickets, cut down brush or trees, and rose thickets. So here are good pictures here on the bottom of where you'd find rabbits. Um, southern facing slopes to anything, especially when there's snow on the ground, um, anything where the sun is peeking through the stuff and, and rabbits can sit and be really warm um, are good spots. And you guys can see here on the map, they're located in uh, basically half of America, anything um, mostly east of the Mississippi right there. So um, found all over. So some rabbit hunting tactics. Um, you wanna walk through thick brush to kick rabbits out of cover. If you're in a group, walk about 10 to 20 yards apart 
and make sure you guys stay in uniform line. Um, don't basically walk as fast or as fast as the slowest person. So you never want to get ahead of um, the line just because, you know, everyone has shotguns and that might lead to some unsafe um, behavior with guns and you, you don't want to have to get into that. Um, so again, make sure to walk as fast as the slowest person to avoid, you know, any, any safety things. As you approach suitable habitat, um, walk slow and stop every so often. This causes rabbits to think they've been seen and take off from where they're hiding. Uh, that's kind of my favorite thing to do. I don't hunt with dogs or anything. I just kind of walk through thick stuff. So every, uh, it, doesn't, it honestly just depends on where you're walking. But if you're, if you're in a spot that looks good, there's probably a rabbit somewhere close. So if you just stop and kind of look around and listen, um, you'll be able to kind of spook them up because they think they, that you see them um, so that they're going to want to run to the next cover. So you'll at least know at least where they're going if you don't get a shot off and kind of where to chase it. Um, but it, that is a very good tip right there. Um, and make sure to cover the edges of fields. Uh, again, rabbits like to spend time in the sun. Check south-facing slopes. They get a lot of sunlight. Uh, and if there's snow, you can even find tracks and scat, and you can just follow those as well to, to the thick cover that they're sitting in. And on the right there is me with a rabbit from last season. So, so rabbit hunting tactics with dogs. Uh, with a dog, you'll be able to hunt rabbits more thoroughly. Um, you'll let the dog work the field and kind of go where it smells rabbits. Um, again, you're going to want to be – spread apart 10 to 20 yards, you know, kind of shoulder to shoulder, but, um, you know, in a uniform line, um, but 10 to 20 yards apart and let the dog handler or whoever owns the dog kind of set the pace of the line. They're the most familiar with how their dog works. So, you know, they'll kind of know how fast to go or how far to trail behind the dog. Um, so let them decide that, but yeah, it, Rabbit hunting with dogs is super fun because you get into a lot more of them because the dogs know where they are. Um, but you don't need a dog to rabbit hunt. You can just go walk some fields and, and you'll do just fine as well. I think Jason's going to be covering squirrel. Great. All right. Thanks, Adam. Okay. Um, just some quick squirrel equipment. Um, the best part about small game hunting is the lack of equipment that you actually need to get into it. Um, this is why it's one of the starting steps for any beginning hunter is to try to get into small game hunting. Um, the equipment, you don't need too much of it, and also the tactics for it can be used uh, on other species. Um, so like rabbit, you can kind of use those same tactics when you start going upland game hunting, uh, go pheasant hunting, stuff like that. And then uh, the squirrel hunting is kind of more similar to the same kind of tactics you use to go deer hunting because it's more about stealth and not, not as much about uh, kicking them out of cover or something like that. So. Um, just quick, uh, the equipment that you need to go squirrel hunting, uh, if you'd like, you have a chair or a pad if you're going to be sitting and uh, doing a, a stationary hunt. Um, you can also, you're going to want to bring a shotgun. Uh, you can use that 22 on private land like we talked about earlier. Um, you can wear camouflage clothing. And uh, if you are going to be walking around, uh, you might want a game vest. So if you're going for a walk, uh, it's always good to have a vest that has a pocket in the back. Um, but do be aware of fleas and ticks on all the animals that if you ever put an animal in your game vest just remember that they're probably covered in something so be mindful of that as well so just to get more into this um, so for squirrel behavior uh, it changes throughout the season um, so in early season because you can start hunting squirrel in august like adam was saying and uh, there's still leaves on the trees and all their food is still kind of up in the trees still too so they spend much more time in the trees. And then come mid to late season, um, they spend more time on the ground. They're gonna be caching their nuts uh, for the winter and all their food is falling from the ground. All the acorns are on the ground and everything like that. So uh, you'll, you can change your tactics up kind of with that. You won't be sitting and looking up anymore. You'll be kind of, you can walk around and try to get them up off the ground too. Um, and then uh, squirrels have two breeding seasons to keep that in mind. They have one um, that's occurring in, uh, late spring, early summer. And then they also have another one in January and February. So that could be a good time if you uh, are done hunting other species and you want to try to get out and you got some cabin fever in the middle of winter, uh, you can head out and they're going to be active during January and February 
Uh, so it's going to be, a, you can have some fun with that. Um, some squirrel habitat, if you want to try to go find some. Um, so it's going to be forest with nut bearing trees because that's their main resource of food. Um, so, and then uh, squirrels will also prefer to nest in tree cavities, but they also make those nests that you may have seen up in the trees called a drays. And it just looks like a cluster of leaves. And you might think it's like a big bird's nest or something like that, but it's really a squirrel's nest. And uh, it's mainly made out of leaves and sticks. And the, they came pretty neat. If you see one that looks like it's been kind of through a hurricane or something, and it's kind of fallen out of the tree, they might not still be using that. So that might just be an old one. So try to find one that looks like it's been active. Uh, and that might be an active squirrel area. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that they are not territorial. Um, they're, not they're not a colony species, but they're not territorial. So you, if you find a good resource of food, um, there could be a bunch in that small area. So like you could find yourself a honey hole or something like that. Um, and then also with the cavities in the trees, just to say, if you see a cavity in a tree that has uh, chew marks around it, like you might see like a, with a bird feeder, a birds can also make holes larger, <clears throat> larger or a mouse hole in your wall. They can choose a, chew the hole a little larger. Um, you see that in a tree as well. So you can see where this squirrel has kind of gnawed on the side of the tree to make it a little bit bigger. Um, there's some better examples of that, but if you see a, a tree hole that's been enlarged, uh, that's a good sign of tree of squirrel activity. Some common food for squirrels and uh, photos of them on the tree and on the ground. Um, you got your acorns or beech nuts and your hickory nuts. So acorns, of course, come from oaks. Beech, um, you can see them on the ground sometimes and in the trees. And then some hickories, like this might be like a shy bark hickory, um, and some of the trees like that. Uh, on a side note, we will actually be doing a uh, plant identification web webinar uh, in the coming month, uh, probably next month that we're getting that together right now. So stay tuned for that if you're interested in identifying some trees um, that will help you in hunting. Um, so some food resources and stuff like that. But these are just some common ones for squirrels. So to go scout for squirrels, um, you can again look for those trees that are nut bearing trees that are common in Illinois. Um, also look for stumps and logs that have nut shells on them. They like to chew their, their nuts on, on, those, on those logs and surfaces. And you might see a bunch of broken up nuts uh, sitting on a, a fallen down tree. Um, and then uh, they, they have disturbed leaves and stuff from them caching their nuts or looking for nuts. Uh, so if, the, if you see a bunch of leaves uh, riffled up and as you get experience, you might be able to tell the difference between squirrels and turkeys and deer because a lot of animals are riffling up leaves to try to find those nuts. Um, and then uh, also tree openings with the chew marks, like I mentioned, and then the drays, and, uh, and then the tracks in the snow, which you can see there in the, in the photograph. Uh, so you can try to tell those apart uh, from the other animals there. Pretty simple. So the two tactics I'm gonna talk about for squirrel hunting is gonna be stationary, uh, well, three actually, stationary, mobile, and then uh, with a dog. Uh, so your stationary hunting tactic is very similar to deer hunting for stationary deer hunting. Um, so it's best to get in there before light. Um, so at least two hours, uh, the first two hours of the day are uh, very active squirrel times. So you wanna get in there before first light, just like you would with deer. And, uh, and uh, get in there quietly and then sit down and just kind of settle down and wait for the, the squirrels to come out of their nest and uh, start moving around, uh, listen for them crawling around, listen for things falling out of the trees and uh, listen for them chattering with each other. And, and then if you get a shot, you can take it. Um, so shotguns are best in early season because of the leaf cover and things like that. It might be hard to have a long distance shot with a 22 um, that you might be able to get later in the season when the leaves fall out of the trees. So you keep that in mind if you're going out on, pri on uh, private land, if you have, well, if you have access to a 22. Um, so those might be more helpful uh, in later season like these, uh, these women are uh, without any leaves on the trees there. Uh, mobile hunting can be really fun. Uh, we went out last fall, oh, not last fall, last winter with uh, some people. We did some rabbit habitat. We cut down some honeysuckle and stuff and made a bunch of uh, brush piles for rabbits to live in. And then in the afternoon, we went for a, a little walk with a couple guys who, were, who stayed back and shot some squirrels. So uh, this was this man's first uh, animal lady shot with a, with a gun, and uh, he was really proud of it. And so to do this, you uh, just move slowly through the woods 
and uh, try to be quiet. You can talk and have some fun too, but just try to try to be stealthy as much as you can as you're walking through the woods. And then uh, if you come across a squirrel, uh, if you have a group of you, it's good to get on different sides of the tree. So because squirrels are really good at putting the tree between you and it, uh, so it's gonna move around. So if you can get multiple sides of the tree, um, someone has a better chance of getting a shot at it. Uh, and then um, if you do see a squirrel go into a hole, it's not really worth sitting around trying to wait for it to come back out. Um, it, it can sit in there forever, it's their house. So uh, just remember that on the way back to mark that and remember that, hey, there's a squirrel up in there. And remember that next time you come back out too, that there's a good habitat along the trail. Uh, and then never shoot up into a tree. That's just bad ethics. Um, don't shoot at a tree cavity or at a, one of those drays at the squirrel nest um, because it's very unlikely that the squirrel is going to fall out of the nest. So just please do not do that. And then hunting with dogs. Uh, it's kind of similar to the mobile hunting. Uh, you're just walking around looking for squirrels, but this time you have your dogs with you. And uh, this can be fun. If, you, if any time you get, have access to going hunting with a trained dog, uh, it's a blast. So um similar um just use your dogs to treat <clears throat> use your dogs to treat the squirrels and then uh get on different sides of the tree so that it doesn't escape and then you can take your shot okay uh we're moving on to some dove hunting now and dan's going to talk about some dove hunting tactics thanks jason um yeah so now we're gonna dive into a little bit of uh dove hunting um a few quick kind of caveats about dove hunting um it's arguably uh, one of the more let's say social um types of hunting you know deer hunting a lot of times you're alone turkey hunting might be alone or with a pair um pheasant hunting you might be hunting with three or four other people a lot of times dove hunting you're sometimes hunting with you know a, a dozen to a couple dozen people um all in a single field and so it can be a lot of fun to just the camaraderie of it the social aspect of it um so We'll just dive right into the equipment. Um, like uh, Adam and Jason have both kind of highlighted, that's one of the, the beautiful parts about small game hunting, and particularly dove hunting, is how little equipment you actually need to get starting and how rewarding it can be and how applicable it is to other types of hunting. Um, so if you're interested in, let's say, waterfowl hunting, uh, maybe further on down the line, dove hunting is actually a great segue um, to start practicing and start training yourself to uh, shoot at moving targets, to utilize decoys, to work on kind of brushing yourself in with some of the natural vegetation there so that the birds can't see you. And so it, it's really applicable to waterfowl hunting if you view it that way. Um, and so that's kind of how I would recommend going about your first dove hunt is just simple. Um, take as little with you as you need. Uh, but the first thing that you will likely need and I highly recommend is a bucket or a chair. Um, a lot of times when you're dove hunting, you're stationary. So you're going to be sitting in a specific spot. Um, remember, dove season does start at the beginning of September. So it is warm. It is buggy. It is humid. The sun just beats down on you. And it's nice to have a nice chair um, to just kind of get off the ground for a little bit, um, relax your body, because you're likely going to be sitting there sweating for a couple hours. Um, unless you're in a really good area, you get to limit out quick. Um, so a bucket or chair can be extremely advantageous. And now remember, birds can see color. So don't use one of those, you know, like this picture shows, don't use a big, you know, bright orange eye bucket or, or even one of the cheap Home Depot orange buckets. Um, and if you do, I've actually used one of those to hunt quite a bit. Um, what I do is I take an old camo shirt um, that may not fit anymore or may be ripped. Um, if you, you can just carry that with you. And once you get to your spot, set up your bucket and just kind of drape that, that, uh, that shirt right over it like it's kind of a mannequin and it'll help break up that image. So you don't have to necessarily buy a camo bucket. You can use what you have. Um, obviously you are gonna need a shotgun because um, we are shooting at aerial targets um, and you'll also need shells. And this is a good point to remember, um, check the hunter fact sheets, check the digest. You may be required to use non-toxic shot. Um, and the most uh, utilized kind of non-toxic shot is gonna be steel. Um, steel works very well for doves. Um, they're very small birds. They're very tiny, um, and the steel punch still punches enough uh, power to to drop them pretty quickly. Um, so non-toxic shot is is usually required for most sites. Um, water is a great thing to have. Again, you're going to be out in there in the early September heat in the middle of a field with likely no shade around. 
Um, so I just want to stress that, especially if you happen to draw a permit for one of those lottery sites, um, you may be sitting in a sunflower field with no shade around, no clouds uh, for a couple hours. So make sure you prepare for that um, ahead of time. Camouflage clothing is also a, a pretty big must. Um, and again, it doesn't need to be high quality. I know a lot of people that spend, you know, hundreds of dollars on uh, a lightweight camo, uh, kind of an early fall camo, a light fall camo. And then the winter, you know, I'm of the belief I like to have as, as little as possible. And so for dove hunting particularly, I'm typically wearing just a pair of khaki pants, um, some kind of brush pants that'll help protect me from, you know, bushes and, and thorns and, and things like that. And then some kind of just cheap camo t-shirt that you might find at Walmart. Um, you don't need to be crazy about your preparations in terms of equipment and gear uh, for small games. So just think simple um, and that could go a long way. And last but not least, uh, decoys. Um, when I first started hunting, there wasn't many people that utilized decoys too often for dove hunting. But over the years, it started to pick up uh, pace, so to speak, a little bit. Um, and so we'll, we'll discuss some different strategies of how to use dove decoys to draw those birds a little bit closer and get them into, get them inside of your effective range. But first, um, before you even, you know, think about dove hunting, you need to understand a little bit of the, the behavior and the ecology of these species. And so I like to start with a, a kind of just a quick overview of what a typical day in September looks like for a morning dove. Um, so they're going to be roosted and they're going to be roosted in trees. Um, so they're going to be asleep in the trees at night. And first thing in the morning um, at dawn, they're usually going to start um, looking to, to head to the feeding areas. Uh, but typically they're going to first stop at a watering hole, uh, get a quick drink before they transition to the, the feeding area. Now, once they get to these feeding areas, they are likely to hang around there for, for quite a bit of time. Um, they're not like, you know, some other species, like let's say a deer who might just come in, grab a few mouthfuls out of an area and then just kind of leave the area. Um, they typically are going to hang somewhat near that feeding site. Um, and likely they may stay there the entire day. And so after they feed, that's when they're going to start transitioning to um, more of a, let's say a loafing behavior. So they're going to try to find an area that's somewhat out of the shade or out of the sun uh, that just allows them to kind of relax and begin digesting their food. And so we'll, we'll call that as a loafing area. Um, after that, um, you are going to start seeing them transition to um, what I call as uh, graveling sites. Um, I just got a private message from Tom that I may be having issues with my audio. Is anybody else hearing issues? I hear you loud and clear, Dan. Same. Okay. Uh, can one of you uh, touch base with Tom and see if he's having any issues? Thank you, Matt. Okay, well, we'll get right back into it. So we'll start off with that morning feeding pattern. So they're gonna leave the roost, grab a quick drink, and then they're gonna head to their feeding areas. Um, now, if you're at a predetermined uh, dove site, so some of these DNR sites that uh, that, that uh, permit is a lottery-based permit, um, they are gonna have basically food plots set up. And so you're gonna arrive, there's gonna be big sunflower seeds or sunflower fields that essentially act as the feeding area for those birds. And so after they feed for a little bit, um, they're going to head to graveling sites. Um, and it might seem a little interesting, but if you've ever driven down, let's say some gravel roads or even um, some of the backcountry roads that just don't see much traffic, um, a lot of times you can see, you know, 10 or 15 doves just sitting right there in the middle of uh, the road. And there's a few different reasons for this. Um, if you know about the, the kind of, let's say the anatomy of, of birds. Um, so obviously they, they do not have teeth. And so they're ingesting these seeds whole. And so they use these graveling sites to basically ingest um, little rocks and little pebbles into their gizzard and crop. And they utilize those to essentially grind up that, that food source and masticate it so that they can begin digesting. And so these graveling sites are an important component of dove behavior because they need the, that, that gravel and that grit um, to help masticate that food so that they can digest it. Um, so you'll often see doves kind of right after a, a big uh, either morning 
feeding session or, or afternoon feeding session, they're gonna start looking for the, these gravel sites. And so it's important that, that we kind of recognize that the majority of dove hunting, um, specifically on public land, a lot of it is geared towards this, this morning feeding period. Um, so it's not you know, trying to, to hunt over the water. It's not necessarily trying to hunt over the roost or over these graveling sites. It's more focused on that feeding pattern. And once you get a very active area that, that is just full of doves and has an active roost nearby that's, that's feeding in this area, it essentially starts almost a feeding frenzy. Um, you'll have doves just kind of flock from all different directions and they'll just keep coming and keep coming as that migration continues to, to push new birds um, down south. And so it, it's again, very common to see doves feeding in and out of an area. And the more doves that are there, the more it's essentially going to attract. Um, and you can utilize decoys to basically trick other doves into essentially thinking that this area is an active feeding area. So dove decoys, um, again, they can be useful, uh, but I wanna, I wanna preface a few things first. Um, dove decoys are certainly not you know, the, the cat's meow, so to speak. Um, they're not gonna make doves appear in an area if they're not already utilizing that area. What it can be really good for is pulling doves a little bit closer to you and pulling them inside of your effective range. Uh, but if you're set up on a field that doesn't already have doves actively feeding in it, um, then the, the likelihood that those decoys are gonna have any effect on the hunt at all are pretty slim. Excuse me. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind that these, the decoys are really used more to just pull them a little bit closer rather than pulling them into the, the field itself. Um, so there's a couple different types of decoys that we'll go over. Uh, we have the shell decoy, um, the full body, and then the spinning wing. So if, if you're familiar with, let's say, waterfowl hunting, you're probably somewhat familiar with the spinning wing decoy. Um, a lot of people will call them the mojo uh, decoy. But essentially, you, like you can see in this top picture here on the right, um, these, these wings are basically just uh, two big flat surfaces on kind of a spinning axle, and the wind is going to hit it just right and make those wings just sit there and spin and spin and spin and spin. And essentially, the, the main reason for that is it just adds a little bit of movement into that area and makes it look just a little bit more realistic. Um, my favorite type of decoys are kind of these full bodies that you see down below. Um, they're extremely cheap in terms of decoys. Um, I think normally around August, late July through August, you can find them in the Walmart kind of outdoor section for you know, 18, 20 bucks for, for six or seven of them. Um, and the nice thing is you can see kind of if you look at how they're clipped onto a tree, um, they basically have clothespins um, essentially kind of glued on to the bottom of that, that, that decoy. And so that allows you to perch it on a, a lot of different things. And so when you're setting up decoys, you want to put a few kind of on the open ground and a few on kind of nearby fences or even a few dead trees. Um, the birds on the ground are a lot harder for other birds to see, but if you can elevate them by putting them on various perches and things like that, Again, it just looks a little bit more realistic. And so dove hunting, um, it, it's basically a, a sit and wait kind of game, um, especially if you're hunting some of these sites that you draw a permit for, um, you're gonna just be sitting there and doves are gonna be kind of flying in and flying out and flying in and flying out. And it's your job to pick out which birds are in your, your effective range and in your zone and try to put a nice ethical shot. Um, doves have very keen eyesight, so it's important to try to break up your silhouette as much as possible. Um, and a lot of people, when they dove hunt, I think they don't spend as much time about, you know, as much care in that as they should. Um, and I, I think it's not a problem. You're still going to see birds, but being a little bit more concealed and a little bit more hidden will allow those birds to come a little bit closer to you and make that shot just a little bit easier and a little bit more, in my opinion, ethical. Um, so I try to get the birds as close as I can to make sure I have a very successful shot. Um, so there's a couple different habitats that you can uh, basically focus on when you're dove hunting. Obviously, standing grain fields. Um, so standing corn fields can be excellent, um, even cut corn fields. Um, I will caution you, 
uh, standing cornfields, I would probably not dove hunt in them unless you have a dog. Um, doves are, are a fairly small bird. Um, they're very nondescript. They're kind of that solid gray like we, you've seen. And they tend to disappear on the ground, um, especially if it's a big standing cornfield or prairie. And so I kind of limit a lot of where I hunt doves primarily based on if I harvest a bird here, am I going to have the ability to retrieve it and actually find it? Um, and so that's why a lot of people hunt over uh, sunflower fields or cut corn fields. Um, those are kind of the, the two main, let's say, habitat types that, that most people dove hunt over. Um, if you are hunting at a DNR site, 99% of those sites will have uh, standing sunflower fields, kind of like you see in this bottom picture here. Um, there will be a T-post stake stuck in the ground. And when you check in that day, um, they'll either assign you a stake to go to or allow you to choose. Every site's a little bit different. Uh, but essentially, and your job is to sit at that one stake until you're done hunting. Um, now, when you do happen to, to harvest a bird, um, you will need to go retrieve it. Um, I've seen a lot of people out there over the years dove hunting. They'll, they'll sit there and they'll shoot five or six birds, and then they'll try to go pick them all up at once. Uh, but what happens with that in a lot of cases is you're going to miscount. You're going to misremember where that bird fell, and you're essentially going to let that meat go to waste. Um, so what I do, I take one shot. I go out there, retrieve my bird, come back, continue hunting. Um, now, when you do leave your steak, um, you cannot take your firearm with you. You need to essentially put your firearm on the ground, unloaded, go retrieve your bird, and then come back and you can reload and get ready for the next bird. And so here's kind of a, a quick, a few safety tips, um, especially at a lot of these uh, public permit sites for dove hunting. Again, there, there's going to be times where there's going to be a couple dozen people hunting over a field. Obviously, this field's going to be big and people are going to be spaced out, uh, but you need to keep a few things in mind. So at all times, you need to know where your hunting partners are and also where everybody else on the line or in that field is. And again, there's going to be stakes there, so there's not going to be people kind of scattered throughout. Um, they're going to be exactly where they should be. But one thing I, I really want to, to comment is after you shoot a bird, leave your shotgun at your stake before you go retrieve that bird. Um, and I know I've mentioned that a couple times, but inevitably it happens. Somebody walks out to go and retrieve a bird. They're carrying their shotgun and then they see another bird uh, maybe fly right behind them and they have their gun in their hand and they re reactionally, you just kind of pick up your gun, try to aim and find the bird. But a lot of times when you do that at these sites, you're gonna be pointing your firearm back at the line. Um, so just leave your gun right there there's going to be plenty more birds um, to come. But you also need to know your zone of fire. So you can kind of view your zone of fire as basically a, a piece of pizza or a piece of pie um, directly in front of you. So it angles a little bit to the left and angles a little bit to the right. And you just want to make sure that when a, a bird flies in front of you and you plan to shoot it, make sure it's in that zone of fire. Never shoot behind you when you're dove hunting because um, you never know exactly who's behind you especially because dove hunting, you're not wearing blaze orange. Um, you're wearing camouflage. And so you need to make sure that you know where everybody else is. Um, one of my big kind of rules of thumb to, to follow specifically with dove and other upland hunting is um, kind of what you see in this bottom picture here. So I like to personally wait until, I, I say it like this, I do not pull the trigger until I see blue sky beneath that bird. And so what that means is he's essentially over the horizon, he's over the tree line, and I'm basically shooting the shotgun straight up. So I know 100% without a doubt, there's nothing in front of that target and nothing behind it. Because um, again, nobody's wearing blaze orange at dove hunts because doves can see color. And so it can be tough to see and know where people are. So if you make sure you always see blue sky, Beneath that dove, you will always know that there's nothing in front or behind your target that you might accidentally um, hit. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jason. Thank you, Dan. Okay, so for our upcoming webinars, what we have posted right now is for June. So we have one on deer scouting, and then we're going to do one on deer hunting 102. 
So if you have taken our Deer Hunting 101 course and are interested in learning a little bit more, feel free to take that. Um, in that, we talk about uh, different scent control and scent and cover scents and tracking scents, things like that. Also, um, how to track a deer um, and gutting a deer and things like that. So we, we did not cover that in 101. And uh, there won't be any regulations in 102. So that's about 40 minutes right there that that frees up um, in the 102 course. So uh, please join us for those if you're interested. Um, we also have online courses if you'd like to take those at your own pace at our website. Um, so there we have them on waterfowl, deer, turkey, and upland hunting 101. Um, so please join, uh, please, do, uh, sorry, please take those uh, if you'd like. Um, it's similar to the content that we have on our PowerPoints, but you don't get the um, live interaction with us. Um, so if anyone has any questions or anything, please put that in the chat, um, be it small game related or hunting related, um, we can help field any of those. Uh, again, um, please follow us on social media if you'd like um, for any updates. It's a pretty good web uh, Facebook page to follow because we also post any type of updates or uh, news for Illinois hunters. So it's a, and we don't really bug you too much. So that's a pretty good Facebook page, I think, just to follow uh, in general. And uh, again, check out our website to register for any of those courses. And uh, with that, I'll open it up to any questions that you guys may have. Yeah, Dan can find a link for that. I, that is through the DNR. For, uh, for what I'm talking about in the chat, it was where can we get the lottery for dove hunting? Dan will put that link in the, in the chat. There you go. From Adam. Uh, the, the easiest thing to plant would be for dove for food would be sunflowers. Yeah, for sure. That's what the DNR uh, has at their sites. They have a bunch of sunflower stands um, that you can put up. Uh, so that's the easiest thing to grow. Um, back, uh, I'm from Pennsylvania. When I was in Pennsylvania, I hunt over soybean fields and uh, adjacent to any type of ag field. And just like Dan talked about their, their movements throughout the day, um, you get them going and going from their feeding. Just be careful with sunflowers. Squirrels love those too. We'll eat the heads off of those pretty quick. I just want to plug our social media again. Uh, the gentleman did ask for the Dove Lottery. We post all that stuff on there, on our Facebook and Instagram. So check that out. We uh, always do reminders a couple weeks in advance and, and up to the day that the lottery closes. So check those out, please. And just another comment. Um, I saw we had a question about what would you suggest for planting um, for dove? Um, yeah, sunflowers are a great option, but I would be a little bit cautious about that. Um, there's a few stories about a couple states a few years ago ordered a new type of sunflower seed, and the actual seed was too big for doves, and they couldn't actually ingest it. Um, so make sure if you do go for um, sunflowers, try to find a, a smaller seed um, than, than some of the more bigger GMO seeds that most people put in their garden. Um, so kind of focus on those that are more driven for wildlife food. Um, they should be a lot smaller of an actual seed and that way the doves can actually ingest it. All right, well with that, um, I thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I think we're going to officially close it. And I, again, hopefully we'll see you at future events. Oh, actually, I just saw we had another question from Ariel. So you can't get permits for squirrels or rabbits at a Walmart or Bass Pro. Um, so remember, for squirrels or rabbits, you're not actually getting a specific permit. So you're going to need your base hunting license, um, your habitat stamp. You will not need, essentially, there's not, so let, let's break it down. So um, for deer hunting, you have a deer tag. So that is good for one specific deer. Um, small game is managed differently. Um, so you're buying kind of an overall license that allows you to harvest a certain amount per day. So you're essentially for um, 
small game, you can purchase all your licenses right online, but you can also get them at all these different stores. Uh, but when you go up, just make sure you get a base hunting license and your state habitat stamp. Perfect. Well, with that, um, I think we'll close it. So again, thank you all for joining us. Um, hopefully we'll see you at, at future events when we can kind of get back uh, to our field events and hopefully we'll run out to you and run into you in the field someday and we can stop and, and chat about your hunt. Um, so thanks and have a wonderful evening.